made, do you want to know everything that can go wrong with these things? Do you want to know what they're like to live with and drive now that they're around about a decade old? Most importantly, do you want to know if you should buy one or not? Well, guys, don't stress. We're going to answer all of those questions and so much more. Let's do this. Now we're guessing if you're in the market for one of these, you're also checking out cars like the Mazda CX-5, the Toyota RAV4, the Honda CR-V, and Nissan X-Trail, maybe even the Volkswagen Tiguan or Kia Sportage, maybe even a Jeep Cherokee or Ford Cougar, or any of the thousands of other medium SUVs on the market. Well see, the Forester, it kind of offers a bit of a, a different approach to the majority of those other guys. Firstly, the all-wheel drive system is constant, and that means that it offers maximum traction all of the time, which is perfect for those that will actually SUV, their SUV, rather than just potter around town. So the majority of all-wheel drive SUVs in this particular segment, they generally only send power to these wheels when these wheels lose traction, but not the Forester. It sends power to all four wheels all of the time. Then, Subaru has arguably been seen as the most like European of the Japanese brands, apparently offering a more premium feeling experience than what even Mazda or Honda can provide, let alone Toyota, Nissan or Suzuki. Then we come to reliability. Now, Talk to any normal general member of public and reliability is almost what Subaru seem to have built their entire reputation and image on. But then talk to any like serious car fans and they'll suddenly raise questions about CVT and head gasket failures. Is there any truth to this when it comes to this generation of Forester? We'll answer that shortly. Now when it comes to these fourth generation or 2014 to around 2018 Foresters, what you're actually getting can be a bit on the confusing side, but to make sense of all that, get ready to hit the pause button. So here in Australia, you're gonna be choosing Foresters spread across three iterations, powered by a choice of four different engines with a couple of transmissions, but their availability will depend on which of the 17 trim specs tickle your fancy. And internationally, there are even more trim specs available than just that. It's crazy. But maybe because there is so much choice, this generation of Forester has been one of Subaru's highest selling vehicles ever, meaning there are loads available on the used market. Even when it comes to the range of pricing, it is huge. These things, they kick off from as little as $6,000 and they top out at just under $40,000. But no matter what financial position you are in, please, please don't get trapped into paying way too much with some ridiculous finance package. So do avoid avoid that mistake, make sure you jump on redriven.com and check out the driver powered car loan calculator on the Forrester cheat sheet or click the driver link down there. See that way you can customize the best finance package that suits you, driver will source you the best possible deals, the whole thing can be done easily online and there are no hidden fees. Best of all you won't have to talk to some complete stranger about your personal finances and by doing all that via those links you're going to get a $150 free fuel voucher. And while we're giving stuff away, how about free express shipping and 15% off your next set of WiperTech wiper blades? Guys, simply hit the WiperTech link down there. They're easy to order online. They're delivered straight to your door for free. They're easy to fit and they're gonna work perfectly. Now, not that you're gonna be able to look at the exterior of your Forester from your now incredibly clear windscreen, but I think these are a really handsome looking car. I feel like the previous gen, the third generation, they're not aging all that well, but this looks pretty bloody similar to the current generation, so it still looks totally current. I do have an issue. For me, it's just, it's too big. Look, I know like the extra size means extra practicality, but I don't know, I just, size-wise, I missed the first and second generation Foresters. For me, that was the right size. I know that like Crosstrek XV is now kind of filling that market, but I don't know, those, those first two generations are just like nuggety little trucks that were cool. So depending on your approach to the Forester, this interior can be either hit or miss. To the Subaru Tragic, they tend to feel that this has lost a lot of the charm and character that the earlier Foresters exuded because, you know, this is trying to appeal to a much broader market and it's just it's become all a bit too gentrified. But on the flip side of that, a lot of consumers maybe didn't appreciate those earlier Foresters because they felt like driving and being in little trucks and they really like this kind of interior. Who's right, who's wrong? Well, it depends on your own preference. For me personally, I wanted to say that I didn't like this interior because I love those earlier Foresters. But I, I've been living with this thing for a little while now and I really like the interior. Like, yeah, it, it does miss some of the charm and character of the earlier ones, but it is a really bloody nice place to be. Look, it doesn't feel as premium as, say, a Subaru Outback, but it definitely has its own kind of feel. It feels more SUV than Outback. That just kind of feels like a really nice jacked up station wagon. This is clearly an SUV with the seating position. There's good adjustability in here. Even the materials used, like everything is quite nice. 
I've got to compliment Subaru on this. They've used, like, I don't generally like the gloss black plastic stuff because, you know, it looks great new, but then it just scratches and looks terrible. But what they've done, in the high traffic areas around here, they've used this, like, hard-wearing plastic, and they've left the gloss black plastic to the lower traffic areas. Smart move, Subaru. Oh, I should mention as well that the materials used in these, they are going to vary depending on which iteration of the fourth gen because Subaru kind of improved the materials with each increasing iteration. Just one other thing with like seating position and ergonomics, the seats themselves, I gotta wish they were more supportive. This is an XT, so it kind of feels like it should have a more sporty or performance sort of seat, but there's hardly any side bolster. So when you start kind of enjoying some corners, yeah, you're sort of sliding all over the place in the leather seats. Obviously, it feels like the seats were made for the American market, if you know what I'm saying, because they're not that supportive. Now, as far as wear and tear in this particular car goes, look, obviously every Forest is going to be different, but this one is used as this owner's everyday driver. It does get a workout, and it's really good for wear and tear. The leather, okay, it's getting a little bit on the kind of firm side, but that can kind of be, I suppose, rejuvenated with some a bit of care. The steering wheel texture is kind of going a bit funny. We're going to talk about steering wheels later in the video because these can have some issues. There's a little bit of you know movement in some of the plastic bits here and there, but overall, considering the workout that this thing gets, Excellent. Now, as far as practicality goes, excellent size door bins. You've got a little bit of a shelf thing up here, which is kind of new. There's a perfectly sized space for your phone right there. Two cup holders here, and the center divider is removable, so it's really easy to clean or make it larger. There's a little removable tray with a coin slot there. Excellent size cubby bin just there. Really good size glove box. A weird, like, a weird storage box for the passenger side? I don't know what you put in there. Maybe a box of pasta or something? Not sure. But that's it for practicality up the front. Now, if you go to any Alpine region, you'll see that foresters are incredibly popular with skiers and snowboarders. And funnily enough, I'm exactly three centimetres taller than snowboard champion Scotty James. This is in my driving position. And it's really comfy back here. So... Well, it's sort of comfy back here. Heaps of knee room, heaps of leg room, and it feels really airy and spacious because the panoramic sunroof is huge. It feels like heaps of space. The weird problem is, but seating position, these seats are in their like furthest back position, I'm pretty sure. Let's double check. It doesn't go any further back. And I just feel like I'm sitting way too upright, like it's like textbook like primary school seating position like this. I just wish it kind of went back a little bit further. Also, the leather is in like great condition, but it's extremely slippery. So in these jeans, I kind of feel like I'm just sliding around seductively all, the, all over the place. But elsewhere with wear and tear, excellent back here. Door cards, fantastic. Again, every forest is gonna be different, but this one, excellent. Excellent for wear and tear in the back. Actually, you wanna know how little wear and tear there is in the back? Cup holders still have their protective plastic film on them. So yeah, that's fantastic. Actually, while we're here, practicality, two cup holders there in an armrest, matte pockets on the backs of the seats, um, really good sized door bins, plus you can actually get to them with legs. A lot of cars you've got to like basically cut your leg off or dislocate your, your elbow and wrist to actually get anything out. Annoyingly, but, and plenty of owners have complained about this, no air vents in the back and like no USB charger, no power charger at all bit annoying. Now practicality in the boot is interesting. It's good, like there's a, there's a good amount of space back here. It is an SUV, you've got to expect that. But there is a bit of a load lip here which is a little bit annoying and it's kind of the fabric. So if you're putting like heavy and hard items through here all the time, that's going to wear. But a good point, you can flip the seats down from these buttons, which is fantastic, and it folds kind of flat. Again, there's just a slight load lip there, which is a little bit annoying. Also, and this is a funny one because Simon that owns this car took this to a Subaru dealership to get serviced, and they didn't know this, but there's actually storage for the parcel shelf under here. Should also show you that when the seats are down, there's plenty of space back here. Now, bad news, I'm afraid, guys. If you're hoping for Apple CarPlay or Android Auto to be fitted as standard in these, you're going to be disappointed. It wasn't. But you know what? Let's turn that frown upside down because it's pretty easy to install Apple CarPlay and Android Auto with aftermarket parts. Actually, you know what? With how incredibly shit some of these infotainment systems can be, one of the best things that you could ever do to one of these Foresters is to fit an aftermarket you know, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto sort of system. Just, guys, make sure you fit a quality system because we have read some horror stories about cheap eBay or Alibaba systems you know, playing havoc with the electronics, sometimes not working after you know, two or three days of being installed. Honestly, there are so many horror stories online about that, so just make sure you get a good system. But aside from the infotainment systems, even 
unlike the early base model examples, they're still going to include everything that you'd expect. But if you upgrade to a more recent top spec example, it's going to add all of this. But if you really want the full fat fourth gen Forester, well, check out the TS, which was given an STI treatment. Actually, that sounds a little bit gross and concerning. Basically what I mean is that Subaru Technica International threw everything at it. Now look, obviously there is so much more to the Forester than just this, but if you do need all the specific details, go to redriven.com and check out the awesome and completely free Forester cheat sheet. Now as far as safety goes, look, thanks to the symmetrical all-wheel drive system, just due to physics, these are like an inherently safe car, but some models will go above and beyond to keep you safe and alive. But to take you through what safety features that you can expect, how about we let Forrester Gump tell you, or at least the guy that plays Forrester Gump. Okay, right from the start, these came equipped with seven airbags, anti-lock brakes, traction and stability control. But find an example fitted with eyesight technology and it can detect road hazards and alert the driver. It can assist with braking and throttle applications in the case of an emergency. Plus, it will have adaptive cruise control, lane departure warning, and so much more. But again, for everything you need to know, go to Redriven.com and check out the cheat sheet. So Subarus of old have had this kind of signature feel about the way they drive. And a lot of Subaru tragics claim that newer models have kind of lost that quintessential signature Subaru feel because they're trying to you know, appeal to a much broader market. But the good news with this, it still feels like a Subaru. I don't know if it's because the center of gravity is low and the symmetrical all-wheel drive system. I'm not, I'm not sure. I'm not an engineer. I don't know why Subarus feel the way they do, but yeah, feels like a Subaru. Like it, it still has that confidence and like sense of purpose that Subarus are famous for, but with this, just the right amount of refinement. It hasn't, for me, it hasn't diluted anything. It's actually enhanced everything. Now this being the XT means it has the two liter turbo petrol engine and it's bloody, it's quick. Like it is seriously rapid. This engine is different to what you'll find in a WRX or a LeVorg or an STI, but like overtaking, pulling into traffic, like accelerating on the freeway, it, it, it hauls. Plus that extra power, look, it's not just handy for acceleration. For example, if you've got four adults on board, a bunch of luggage as well, and you're in like adverse conditions, that extra power is gonna come in so handy. Actually, just what these are like in adverse conditions, or more specifically, off-road. Look, we're not for a second claiming they're going to give a, you know, a Jeep Wrangler or a Toyota Land Cruiser a run for their money when it gets you know, to serious off-roading. But Forrester's fitted with X-Mode and a set of all-terrain tyres. They can do some incredible off-road antics. If you don't believe me, jump on YouTube and type in fourth generation Forrester off-road and you'll be amazed at just what these things are capable of off-road. But guys, think about that for a second. That means this thing has like serious performance abilities on-road while being seriously capable off-road. That's, that's an incredibly good mix, especially at this price point. Another positive as well, like the ride quality in this is excellent. I had a, an XV or a Crosstrek of the same year and its ride was bloody harsh and crashy. This is excellent. Also, because the ride isn't harsh at all, it hasn't turned the interior plastics into some kind of brittle symphony of crackles and rattles. In here, silent. It sounds like a new car. Uh, another positive as well, look, I know earlier I criticized these for getting a bit too big, but as far as driving it goes, it doesn't feel too big because like the glass house is huge. It's really easy to kind of judge into car parks and tight situations. It's excellent. But we've got to do this. What's the bad news? Firstly, the transmission. Look, with the CVT, look, unless you're driving a whole bunch of different cars back to back every week, like what we do every single week, you're probably never gonna be able to tell the difference between a CVT and an auto. It probably won't bother you that much. But for us, it's just, it's like the least convincing part of a really good car. And it kills me that these were never at least offered with a manual option. It's just so disappointing. Plus these CVTs, yeah, they have a pretty horrific reputation when it comes to reliability and mechanical issues, but we'll cover those in a second. And then there's the steering, like it just feels a bit light and vague. This one's probably one of the better ones I've driven of the fourth generation, but some of the early ones, it's like the steering isn't actually attached to the front wheels at all. It's just this vague recommendation of directing the car into a different direction. Another negative, not so much in this car, this is getting about 10.8 litres per 100 k's on average, so it's not too bad, but plenty of owners have complained of excessive fuel consumption. 
And finally for negatives, just the incessant beeps and bongs, like everywhere you go, beep, 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 boop, 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 constantly, just shut up, or at least give me the option to turn the beeps and bongs off permanently. Okay, now before we get into what goes wrong with these, obviously not every forester is going to suffer the issues we're about to mention. Thousands of them have never had and probably will never have an issue. Some of them do. So let's get into it, start with the exterior. So the sensor that tells you how much water is in the washing reservoir is actually part of the reservoir itself. The problem is if that sensor goes, you've got to replace the entire bloody thing. Okay, the windscreens are on the thin side and they can apparently crack really easily. The problem is if the car is fitted with the eyesight system, well then you have to use like a genuine Subaru windscreen and the eyesight system has to be recalibrated and all of that costs up. Costs up, adds up. <laughs> Also with the eyesight safety systems, apparently if the conditions are very adverse, like there's lots of rain or it's snowing or the windscreen's dirty, the safety systems or the eyesight systems can fail to work. And that's annoying because it's generally in those conditions that you need a bit of assistance with extra safety. So not good enough Subaru. Okay, next up, if the car has been washed with like silicon based car wash fluid regularly, the silicon can actually affect the switch that controls the brake light and the brake light can stop working. That's not that important, but who needs brake lights? Okay, next up, there are some issues with the wheel nuts. Apparently the wheel nuts can seize and even kind of snap off the, the actual stud itself. It's not a common issue, but if you are changing the wheels, just take it easy, be aware of that. And that's about it for exterior problems, but make sure you do get underneath it. These, a lot of these do go off-road, so make sure you get underneath it and look for any signs of abuse. Actually on that, there's a bunch of other things you do need to check out if you're buying one of these. Go and check out our ultimate used car buyer's guide and ultimate 4x4 buyer's guide videos before you buy one, because it could save you thousands. Okay, now inside, as I mentioned earlier, some of these infotainment systems can just suck a These things can utterly suck. I know from experience they're not actually a touch screen, they're more of a punch screen. And even some of the later ones, which have been improved as far as their usability goes, even in this car, what I've found is that when the sun is coming from behind you, you can't actually even see what's on the screen. You can just see kind of the LED panel kind of behind it, so it makes it impossible to use. Annoying. I should mention some owners have had no problems with their infotainment systems, or maybe they're just far more tolerant than I am. Now guys, you've got to be really careful when cleaning the seats, especially in some of the earlier models. Apparently there was a fault in the design, and basically if you clean the seats with steam, the steam can play havoc with the electronics, completely destroying the electronics, and a whole new seat can be over $1,000 each. Now the material on the steering wheels, again depending on what you know, spec you've got and which material is used, the material can peel off the steering wheel. Even with this one, it's kind of doing this weird, it's like there's chunks out of it from like you know, a ring taking marks out of the steering wheel. It can be reupholstered, it's just annoying that it does that in the first place. Now there are a few reports that the air conditioning clutch, it can fail to engage, but the good news is it's a pretty easy fix. Just jump on YouTube and search, you know, uh, fourth gen Forester AC clutch repair, and there's heaps of videos explaining how to do it easily. Now before we get into the mechanical issues, firstly a massive thank you to Simon for lending us his Forester, you're a legend mate. A huge thank you to all the Subaru Forester owners groups for helping us research this car. We couldn't have made this video without you guys. And finally, a massive thank you to you. Guys, because of your amazing support, Redriven has become one of Australia's fastest growing automotive YouTube channels. But the thing is, we've noticed that the vast majority of you that watch our videos don't actually subscribe. Now look, we promise you, if you support us by subscribing, the more support we get, the bigger and better and more of these videos that we can make for you. So yeah guys, please keep supporting us, you guys are legends. Now mechanically, what can go wrong with a fourth generation Forester? Well I can't tell you because I'm not a mechanic, but Jim is. I'm going to start with the diesels here and basically they are a pain in the ass. They have a lot of often misdiagnosed DPF complications. Before you go and spend thousands on a new DPF, there's a few things you really should check. They are prone to splitting intake and turbo pipes. When there's a leak there, it causes complications. Often the MAP sensor, that's the manifold absolute pressure sensor, often they clog up with carbon and shit. That also causes DPF issues. And another one is you need to reset all the oil dilution tables. And for those of you playing at home, you do need a scan tool for that. Now, after all that's been looked at, if you're still having DPF issues, do a forced regeneration. And if that doesn't work, well then maybe you might need a new DPF, but nine times out of 10, it's not the DPF's fault. The FB series, the four cylinder petrol, that's a bit of a workhorse for Subaru and it's in a lot of different models. 
they are unfortunately known for oil leaks and oil consumption. Now the oil consumption issue has killed a lot of these. They have a 12,500 kilometer service interval, which is okay, 10 would be better. But often when they're using oil, they don't make it to 12,500 Ks without being topped up and people forget and then they just blow up. They do big end bearings and then they're dead. So you can expect to have to top it up between services if you want it to last. As for the leaks, look, typical for Subaru, they have leaks from the head gaskets. They also have leaks from the valve covers. They also have leaks from the cam carrier, which is the top part of the head. Now the valve covers, they're relatively inexpensive to fix, but the cam carriers or the cam bearing boxes, whatever you want to call them, and the heads, they often leak really badly and they are very expensive to fix. We're talking up to three and four thousand dollars. Now the FA20 Turbo, they do cop a lot of criticism for being unreliable, but the reality is in stock unmodified form, if they've been well serviced, they're actually pretty reliable. Yes, they do suffer from the same oil leak problems as the non-turbo, but overall they're pretty reliable. Their reputation of being unreliable comes from the ones that are heavily modified. Look, a Subaru tuner will tell you, yeah, they're capable of making great horsepower, but they'll also tell you making horsepower reliable in one of these is very expensive. What happens, people wind them up beyond their budgets and then they blow up and they complain about how unreliable they are. Look, I think in a lot of cases, self-control is the problem here more so than their reliability. Now, as for the transmission, the manual, the six-speed manual is actually pretty good and you shouldn't expect too many issues with that. But the CVT, look, the CVT has a terrible reputation for reliability. And statistically, it is actually one of the least reliable CVTs on the market. Now, I'm not saying they're all bad. I mean, some people have them and they've never had an issue with it, and that's great. But the ones that have had issues out of warranty can easily spend between five and $7,000 repairing these. Now, in some markets, Subaru did extend the warranty on these because it was such a common problem. But that factory support is not gonna be there forever. So the cost is gonna come back to the owner. So it's definitely a big risk worth thinking about. Actually, the prices Adam was talking about earlier, if you're looking to buy one, you really should add five to $10,000 to that just as a contingency if you have CVT issues. Look, so you know what the Forester is like, especially in XT trim with the CVT? It's almost like finding the perfect partner. Like they're fit, they're attractive, they're intelligent, they're funny, they can even cook, but they also sometimes have like bad breath. And that bad breath, it might, be really seriously bad gingivitis. Look, the Forester in general, it, it ticks so many boxes and ignoring some of the transmission concerns, this might actually be the best all around SUV in its class. And as we said, there are thousands of owners out there that have never ever had an issue. The problem is if or when that CVT goes cactus, it could cost you thousands of dollars. So therefore, should you buy one? It's a cautious yes from us, but only if it has a, like you can confirm that it has a thorough service history, it ticks all of the boxes, it's in the best condition possible, and you easily have a spare five to eight thousand dollars hidden away in a the Forester CVT has shit itself account, then yeah, buy one, oh, or if it's a manual. Otherwise, if it doesn't tick all of those boxes, no, do not buy one, and don't buy the diesel either. The petrols are just way better. So guys, do you buy one of these, or do you buy one of the thousands of other options out there? Let us know in the comments. See you next time. I, 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 oh my God, what's my brain doing? Wow.